Hello, and welcome to Blue Table Talks. My name is Sherry Hubert. I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, and welcome to our series where we get to know and um, share with you the experiences of our students and the other members in our community. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we hope you enjoy it. You'll get a chance to really understand um, in you know, the voices of our students what they are living, what they're doing, how they got to this point in their career and in their academic experiences, what their experience is here at, at Fuqua, and for those of you who are joining us back again, um, welcome back. We're glad to have you back for this series and session. Today's session will be focused on um, navigating business school while also maintaining black excellence. And it's so apropos that we have this wonderful panel and guests um, in the midst of Black History Month. Although we celebrate it every single day of the year, That's right? right? That's right. right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you guys all out there relax, enjoy, and uh, without further ado, let's get to know some of our, uh, our guests today. I'm going to ask them to each introduce themselves, and then we'll have a series of conversations and questions. Um, we also actually had some questions from the audience that we'll try and incorporate into the conversation as well. So, Steve, you want to? Awesome, I'll, I'll kick us off. So, um, hello everyone, my name is Stephen Ezekoye, and I am from the Washington DC metro area, or Maryland, and I am the MBA co-president, um, a role I'm really happy to, to dive deeper into, and I'm also a case Social Impact Fellow. Hi everyone, I'm Oziyoma Uwazurike. I'm a Global Executive MBA, um, class of 2025. I'm also a double dookie, graduated uh, undergrad 2016. Um, currently working as a senior regulatory affairs associate at CSL Securus, which is a global influenza vaccines pharmaceutical company. Hi everyone, my name is Kendra Brown. I am a second year daytime MBA student here at Fuqua. Um, I'm originally from Norfolk, Virginia, um, and on campus I'm involved in MBAA along with Steven. Um, I serve as one of the VPs, and I'm also on uh, BBSA, which is the Black Business Student Association here at Fuqua. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Enrique Pifram. I am from Nassau, Bahamas. Um, I'm currently in the Masters of Quantitative Management program, um, and I there serve on the MQM Association as the Communications Chair, and I'm also on the admissions team. Excellent, well thanks you guys, thanks for joining. Thanks I know you guys have busy, busy lives at this point. We're just yeah. talking about spring breaks coming up, and so there's, <laughs> there's a big break happening soon, so a lot to get prepared to, to enjoy that. Um, maybe we could start off with, you know, why why did you choose um, this business school journey, um, and you know, in what way did your you know experience prior to business school or your family impact your decision to pursue your business degree, but also in particular then kind of why Fuqua? Anyone can start us off. Oh, I can get us started yeah. because um, for me, I never thought I would be going to business school. No one in my family has went to business school, and like I'm the second person in my family to pursue a master's degree. Period. So, when I was deciding what to do with my life, I had to like take a moment to think because I didn't really have any direct mentorship. So my brother did Teach for America, so I, he recommended it was a great leadership development program. So I did Teach for America about an hour and thirty minutes away from here in Battleboro, North Carolina, and that was the first time I was. In a community that wasn't my own, I, mm. I grew up in Metro DC. Like it was an urban setting. Like grew up low income, but I was able to go and have a new experience. Mm. And um, a lot of my students that were really like innovative and entrepreneurial. They had all these ideas of how they can make their community a better place. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a shame that there was no way for it to actually happen. And I felt like me being a teacher, I wanted to go and get the best and most relevant insight on how to you know to lift up social ventures, how to actually give more people of color, more people in communities that have been underestimated, overlooked, access to these you know, tools that, so they can you know, build a life. And I feel like Fuqua and Case particularly was something that was mm -hmm. so compelling to me because like, I'm learning how to do it. And I'm also seeing how social ventures are made and run and what makes it, it, it pop, what makes it you know, like, usually fail, and what can you learn from them? And I, I feel like it's just like a, a unique place for me to be. Mm -hmm. And for those who cases our center for the advancement of social enterprise, so yeah, very popular center for a lot of our students. Yeah, absolutely. What about others? Any others? Want yeah, to I can go. Um, for me, I had a little different path. Um, so with my background, I'm also Nigerian, um, and 
I don't know if you guys know this, but growing up in a Nigerian household, you have three things you can be. Lawyer, doctor, engineer. That's it. <laughs> so I always thought I was going to go to med school. Um, that was always my path post Duke. I took a few years off. Um, but I always wanted to get my MBA as well. Um, so it's going to be an MD, MBA mm -hmm. um, joint degree. And, you know, I when I started in the pharma, com uh, pharma industry, I realized that I really liked the way that, you know, the business world and the medicine world kind of collided um, and the way they intertwined um, and wanted to explore more of the business side than I did, you know, kind of wanting to be bedside and mm -hmm. being a surgeon, which was my past dream. Um, so I decided to pivot and, you know, st stayed in, a, uh, in my company for a few years. And then it wasn't until I got to this new company that I'm at now and I realized, you know, I, I feel as if I've become an expert in my field in regulatory affairs and I kind of want um, a broader mm -hmm. a broader take on the world of business. And I realized that getting my MBA was going to um, help me, you know, kind of fill in those gaps that I had that I was um, looking to fill in. So. And how did you come to find us here at Fuqua? Yeah, well, I mean, being an a undergrad, I you know, knew of Fuqua and um, had a few friends that went immediately right after they'd graduated. Um, and then when I was looking, um, you know, during, throughout my search, uh, my brother actually went to a different um, business school and, you know, he was like, well, I also applied to a few schools in North Carolina and Fuqua just kind of came back up. Um, and then through the admissions process and um, a ton of different alumni that I had through my network, um, I was reconnected with Fuqua. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, we're glad you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I can share. Um, I honestly always knew that I was going to come to business school. Um, I went to Spelman, um, and Spelman did not have a business program. They're a liberal arts school. Um, and so I was an economics major. And for economics major, they pushed either investment banking or consulting. Um, so I really didn't know a path of how to get into marketing, so I ended up going into consulting. Um, and when I went to consulting, as I knew I wasn't fulfilled, like I knew I always wanted to do marketing, and then COVID hit. And so I was like, okay, this is the perfect time for me to kind of make that pivot. And that's when I started, um, you know, doing my research on business school. And I had a mentor um, at work who really encouraged me to use business school to make the pivot and everything. And so um, that was really my path um, here. And I'll jump in as well. I mean, uh, I resonate a lot with uh, Stephen here. Um, being a first generation student, um, so there's really no like path laid out for you. You kind of have to like forge that for yourself. Um, I knew that I wanted to keep learning. Um, so I was even, I was working in, uh, in the tech industry um, as an analyst, really like under, like using data and deriving insights from it. And that's something I'm passionate about, right? Like telling stories with mm -hmm. actual numbers. Um, but I knew I could do more and I looked around at my colleagues and I see the technical skills that they have. And I'm like, I want to develop that. And um, I started searching for programs that were like, you know, relatively quick where I can get everything that I need to get as well as like merge the business side of things and be able to like interpret insights and make strategic decisions and I felt like uh, the MQM program at Fuqua was like the perfect fit for me and that's what led me here. Oh great, well, I mean that, you know, we were talking about this earlier but yeah. I mean we'd love to have more students, especially black students um, mm -hmm. interested in, who are interested in STEM, interested in our programs, you know, so I'm glad that you found your way here. Um, you know, this, the topic of this session is really about black excellence, mm -hmm. and so I'm really curious, how do, you know, any of you can answer, how do you define black excellence? What does it mean, black excellence? What does that mean to you, mm -hmm. and how does that manifest itself or show up in your life? I think it, I think it means basically um, being able to overcome adversity. You know, we have societal structural things that are um, that kind of build up a wall that does, don't want us to you know break through. But being able to be resilient um, and press through that, and make your way up, and be successful, um, I really think is the definition of black excellence. And also, once you get to where you are, bringing people with you. Mm -hmm. um, never forgetting where you came from yeah. um, is definitely like how I would define like black excellence. Yeah, I, I wanna add on to that because mm -hmm. I, I do believe black excellence is being an opportunity maker, like everything mm -hmm. you just mentioned, but like using our position or being in a, uh, in a 
certain way where you can get more people in. Like, I hope it means something that, like, I was here right now mm -hmm. and I'm doing this chat. I hope someone can see that they can do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, like, it may be a challenge, but, like, there's a way and people will help you. And I feel like the people who are always willing to support one another, like, mm -hmm. that's like, how you show your black excellence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I agree, and I feel like it has a lot to do with uh, the sense of grit, like Kendra was talking about. Mm -hmm. We have these challenges and obstacles that we face just because mm -hmm. of you know how we, we show up in the world, but I think what's important is like knowing that and continuing to just put your best foot forward mm -hmm. to continue to show up in what it is you, that you do and you're passionate about um, the best way you know how, and I think that's what Black Excellence is. It, and I'm curious, so you know, both you know, Kendra, you and Enrique were you're at Spelman, you're at Morehouse. Um, do you feel like this sense of black excellence from an academic perspective, was that born by virtue of you going to these historically black colleges and universities? I don't know, if, you know, for those of us who didn't, who went to predominantly white institutions, um, you know, where do you think that, was it always instilled in you from the very beginning? You know, was it our parents? Like, where did we get this notion of, of the sense of black excellence and this notion of like we need to pay it forward too. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. No, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I definitely think attending Spelman helped. Um, it's an environment where you know you just fit in, mm -hmm. and everything is kind of like catered to you as a black woman. Spelman specifically is a all women's HBCU, so catered to you as a black woman. So when we had speakers come in and speak. Carla Harris, um, Issa Rae, like we had these okay. big mm -hmm. giant names that would come speak to us and mentor to us. Um, and so that's kind of like what I knew. It never mm -hmm. seemed impossible for me to make it there because it was always presented to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I really appreciate the way Spelman always poured into us, um, especially, you know, just bringing those leaders and investing um, in those mentors for us. Yeah, and institutions like Morehouse and Spelman, they like, they pounded into you from mm -hmm. orientation, you know, that you gotta be on top of your stuff mm -hmm. and we're gonna like pour all of our resources into you to making you the best version of you as possible. Um, but also I think it's something that like, even before I went to Morehouse, I, I had it in me and, you mm -hmm. know, growing up Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> there's so much uh, pressure to succeed. Um, there's mm -hmm. this notion that you really um, have to make it far and, um, you know, there, you, you can't accept failure. There's no room you don't have the luxury to. Um, and so I think, that kind of like being brought up in that light uh, kind yeah. of contributes to where I'm at now. Yeah, I think that's um, very true. You know, growing up Nigerian, there was um, that was it. Like you have to succeed, and it's our parents came, you know, to the states in order for our children to succeed, right? To give mm -hmm. them that opportunity. Um, so I I knew that in my household it was like that was that was it. Like that was the only um, way forward and you know some someone might try and take that away from you but you find another way right mm -hmm. um, you tap into your support system your network um, I and then on top of that I think I grew up as the first daughter um, mm -hmm. which is very huge in our culture um, in our Nigerian <laughs> culture so I was like you know you're Nigerian you're black you're the first daughter like you that's it that is you have to succeed you have mm -hmm. to be the first you have to you know, like really overcome those obstacles that folks are throwing at you to um, pave the way, not only for your family and those who are coming, and for those who are coming after mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I'm curious. How do you? What do you? What strength? What do you draw on mm. in times of you know adversity? As a student, maybe just in life, you guys, you know, all were professional. Mm -hmm. You're currently still working, but mm -hmm. you all were professionals before you got to business school. What do you? What do you draw on to um, to push? through kind of adversity yeah. and to continue to excel, you know? So I'm also Nigerian, yeah. I, I didn't mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I grew up with, with a single parent at mm. home and my, my mother worked incredibly hard for mm -hmm. uh, me and my siblings. And like it, for me, she always preached to us, like it, I don't care what you do, but like if you want to do something, put all your heart in it, mm -hmm. set the bar high. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and be proud of the fact mm -hmm. that you're putting in like a good day's work because it's leading to something. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think of just being able to juxtapose her experience growing up in Nigeria mm -hmm. and my experience growing up in America. Like she knows that like it may not be perfect, but like it's always worth it. You put your best foot forward. So some days there are 
moments where you, you don't feel like you're up to the task or you're going to meet the moment. But I just know that like my mother will be proud of me when I, when I, if I just do my best. Mm -hmm. And and like that was her highest expectation of me. So I, in days where I don't feel like I'm up to the task, I just really think like, oh, like my mother worked too darn hard to, like, mm -hmm. for, for me to not do anything that doesn't like, you know, maximize any outcome that I, I try to do. So mm -hmm. I can focus on that. Yeah, that's how I feel too. Like my mom sacrificed so much in terms of her career mm -hmm. in order to put me through college, right. in order to really make sure that I had the educational opportunities that she didn't. So for me, I same, it's just the, I feel like I owe it to yeah. her and to the I how much she's invested, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm curious. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask a question that came actually from our audience. Um, as you think about your experience at Fuqua, how would you say Fuqua invests in various communities of color? Um, you know, perhaps during the recruiting process, you know, or as you're kind of continuing to work and you know develop from professional development. Like, how? What are the kinds of things that you've engaged in? as a student that really you feel will help you advance your career? Um, sure, so I attended both last year and this year um, the National Black um, Conference, uh, which FUCA will pay for students up to a certain amount to attend the conference. Um, and there's a lot of companies there um, that you can network with, they do recruiting. Um, I know a few people, I did early recruiting, but I know a lot of people who received opportunities from the conference. Um, and so I think FUCA does a really good job in promoting that conference specifically and um, funding students to attend it. Mm -hmm. Ozzy, what about you? I mean, in your current role, mm -hmm. um, have you been, what have you been able to leverage from your experience in the program so far to help you uh, professionally? Yeah, um, I feel as though they, FUCA, uh, gives access to a lot of, um, so like the CMC, for example, mm -hmm. the Career Management Center, um, you know, like they're there from the first day and they're like, you know, however we can help you, um, you know, look for whatever the next step is. I know that that's something that a lot of students in the Gimba program and myself as well are taking advantage of, um, as well as also, you know, making or giving opportunities for the students to create their own clubs. I know mm -hmm. with the Gemba and the daytime, it's a little different, right? Like the clubs are kind of, you know, they already exist. Yeah. Um, whereas with Gemba, you're giving the opportunity to create, you know, different clubs. So there are a few um, clubs that, you know, that exist now in the class of 2025, like the, you know, Women in Business and um, a Global Impact Project Club that, you know, focuses on, um, you know, making a difference in the uh, different places that we go to for residency. Mm -hmm. So um, I think just those opportunities, you know, saying like, hey, we can help you out in this, you know, if you're looking to transition from the current job you're in now to a different job, um, or if, you know, if you want to create a club or an affinity group, that sort of thing, that they make that possible. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And I think the unique thing about the Global Executive MBA program is that the all like the career, you know, re, you know support, mm -hmm. faculty, mm -hmm. they all travel with you to exactly. all these kind of countries exactly. around the world, right? So exactly. it's, it's really great um, customer service. Exactly. You know, and, so. and for me, I can give like a personal example mm -hmm. from just this morning. Um, we have uh, the leadership uh, discussion series that we have. Um, Stephanie Robertson, who is the um, associate dean of uh, DNI, she held a um, a workshop on understanding privilege, mm -hmm. and like these are the things that we have access to. And not only is Stephanie Robertson just an incredibly talented person, she's a role model, mentor. Like mm -hmm. I can go to her, and, and she can connect me to opportunities. She can help me figure out problems at the moment it's happening. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like I have like an advocate in, in a school where I may not feel like you know like. I'm really in the majority. <laughs> I feel like someone has my back, you know, as I'm navigating this really new, you know, like area. I never thought I'd be in business school, never thought I'd be getting an MBA. My mother still doesn't even know what I'm doing here. So. <laughs> but, but I have someone who is not only like well versed in, you know, the, the D, E, and I aspect of, you know, what it means to go to an incredibly a, a diverse business school, but also help me navigate, like, the outside world as well, and I mm -hmm. feel like that's uh, incredibly important. Well, let's stick on that, actually. That's a great segue, because this is another question that came in from an audience that specifically focuses on the work, um, the DEI work. So how does FUQA integrate DEI into the curriculum to create supportive, you know, supportive academic experiences, or what are the, in addition to the privilege of uh, workshop you talked about, what are some of the other programming or events or initiatives that you've been a part of, that your classmates have been a part of, that are focused on this notion of diversity, equity, inclusion? Mm -hmm. Can you share anything? 
I, I, first thing that comes to mind is like implicit bias training. Mm. I know specifically with the MQM program, it's a very international program. I think it's like 70% international students, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it's a lot of times uh, these are students who are coming to the U.S. to study for the first time. And so I think workshops like that where they have not um, necessarily worked or lived in, in a space like uh, that is so like culturally culturally diverse, like right. the United States or like a campus of Fuqua. It's important to um, have these training sessions um, led by faculty uh, to really understand, uh, you know, microaggressions mm -hmm. and how we interact with people and respect cultures and differences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that Fuqua as a whole puts a very like good emphasis on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see it in the events that they constantly have regarding like. Uh, various holidays and traditions of different cultures and um, you get to partake in these things and respect and understand and learn and I think that's really important. That's great. Yeah, um, yeah we also have classes that um, are kind of geared towards um, that so I took women in leadership um, which also has a portion of the class that is geared towards intersectionality and so what does it look like to be a black woman in leadership mm -hmm. an Asian woman in leadership mm -hmm. um, so that was very insightful and helpful as um, in terms of growth as a leader and being very specific of what does that look like for me as a black woman and so um, I think Pupa does a really good job mm -hmm. of integrating that into the classroom yeah. Absolutely. I think for those of us who are virtual with the Gemba um, conferences and talks as well. I think um, FUQA does a really good job of making sure that they are bringing in, if it's not from you know the FUQA faculty, we had, a, there was a talk with um, a law professor that we had a few weeks uh, yeah, ago. That was really yeah, good. that was really, um, really powerful. So having those type of discussions and bringing in different faculty and then just the opportunity, I'm going to a conference um, next week, I think it's investing in women. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's something related to that. So they do a really good job of making sure that you know you may not be you know in the building here, but we can give you access to um, different professors, different people from different backgrounds, just to kind of um, you know just share uh, the information, share the wealth. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking. There's the so the women in, um, investing conference. Mm -hmm. I just met with. Uh, we have also have a global. Um, equity working group, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is, uh, do you want to talk about what it is? Um, well, it's a collective mm -hmm. of yeah. people of all backgrounds who are really working towards, you know, advancing gender equity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's like a, like almost like a steering committee, but like mm -hmm. we yeah. come together and put together like a, an actionable list of priorities that we need to do to advance equity in, in these focus areas. And it's really low hanging fruit most of the time. Mm -hmm. And I think what it does highlight is that like once we're in conversation and we're we believe the same things and we want to really just work together to see what we can make of it. Like it, a lot happens and I think that it's really cool that the school facilitates that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more we're able to have these discussions like like the workshop that Stephanie hosted this morning or initiatives like Goog or in like a, in the NBAA we started a initiative called the um, the 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 council the, mm -hmm. the um mm -hmm. DEI council. Mm -hmm. So it's it's one representative from all the affinity clubs. We meet about once a quarter, just talking about things mm -hmm. like like what, what do you see, what do you notice, what should we do, how can we respond to this, how can we sense that, how can we like elevate this, how can we you know bring more light to that, and I think like those moments where we're together, we're talking about things yeah. again, like and I think like the Fuqua understanding is that like you know we're all in this together mm -hmm. a team and so we, we're just more inclined to work through these things together mm -hmm. and like you just learn so much you, you gain a really deep appreciation for your peers mm -hmm. and again it's it's facilitated by the school and yeah. so like I think that's just uh, incredible well it's facilitated but the students mm -hmm. are really the ones driving it it's a very I mean you guys know it's a very student driven culture and so I've just been so impressed I mean because this global equity working group it's all it's student driven right? it's in partnership with administration and faculty but a lot of what you guys are talking about or, or activities and events and initiatives that are driven by students um, and executed by students and so it's it's you know I think even that is another way of showing up from an excellence perspective right mm -hmm. in the midst of you guys you know being students and having to go on your own journey you're also willing to pour into this institution and make it better leave a legacy which I think is great yeah going off of that I didn't even mention um, the black business students association yeah. mm -hmm. which is <laughs> plays a major role in uh, recruiting. We also bring companies in that come here specifically to recruit 
um, black students. Um, and so that's a very helpful resource as well, again, driven by the students, um, but supported by people. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna focus a couple, you know, this question to you, Kendra and OZ. Um, can you share the importance of being a black woman mm -hmm. in business school? Um, what's that like for you? How have you felt as though that's been a, a competitive advantage mm -hmm. for you? And, what, and, then, and then alternatively, are there uh, aspects that make it a little bit more challenging? And then, you know, where do you go to kind of get energy and support when, when, the, when it is a little bit more challenging? Yeah, I can start. Um, so I think for me, it's all about representation, right? Um, I have been fortunate enough to have several black leaders, both men and women, in my life in the pharma industry that have kind of you know inspired me and um, very been very intentional with their mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that I wanted to come to business school to be that representation for other uh, for other women, for other uh, you know young girls coming behind you know thinking like I want to do I want to be a Fortune you know 500 CEO mm -hmm. right. Um, but it, sometimes it's it's easier to live that dream when you see it being lived, That's right? right. Um, so that was, you know, like my, one of the main things when I was thinking about, um, you know, just being a black woman in business school. And um, Duke does a really good job of making sure that, you know, that they are pulling from different, um, you know, sources to make sure that there is, um, you know, just, you know, different minorities and different people represented in all of their, all of their programs. Um, I think um, I have a few uh, women in the program that are, you know, that are black or African or, you know, just from different um, parts of the diaspora, um, and it's really nice to, to see that, um, and I think that's where I draw a lot of my, um, you know, my source of energy from, right, is seeing them, um, you know, being able to talk to them about, you know, like challenges or like, you know, what went well, what didn't went well, what can we do better, um, and then just also thinking about the future, right, I think um, when I think about what this means for someone else, like it, it, it drives me, it keeps me going. So that's kind of where I, you know, pull right. a lot of my energy from. Great. Yeah. I'm um, going off of that, you know, it's really hard to be a double minority. You know, you have this right. double jeopardy of being black and being a woman, mm -hmm. um, and arguably um, the most oppressed mm -hmm. two minority groups that we're a part of. And so sometimes it's difficult to kind of figure out where you fit in. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do, going off of uh, what you asked, how has it been to the advantage, when you do find the community, which is another reason why I want to be here for that representation, when you do find that community, those people will really ride for you, mm -hmm. especially other black women. Um, I think we do a really good job at lifting each other up, especially here in the Fuqua community. Um, and so um, that's one of my goals for sure, being here, yeah. is yeah. to be here to lift others up yeah. um, that look like me. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, okay, so for, oh, I'm going to open it up. Um, what mis this is another question that came from the audience. What misconceptions did you have as uh, prior to enrolling in business school, and how has your perception changed since you've been at Duke? Just some more general. Okay. I honestly thought, and the, there is academic rigor for sure, but I really thought that I was going to like <laughs> be in the books a lot more than I am. But a big part of business school, and I'm sure everybody heard, has heard, is the networking. Mm -hmm. And I think that like that's where your major opportunities come. Um, and so I, I just didn't know like how important that networking aspect yeah. of business school was going to be. But um, it's a, it's a great thing. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's shocking. I think for me, I thought it was going to be like a boys club. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I always feel as if like you know they talk about business school and it's always you know from the perspective of like this is something for men. Um, but I mean, I think ha like maybe forty percent of our class is women, um, and then on top of that, it's there is no club. Like it, it's with the networking, right? Like everyone comes together to, if I have an opportunity at my place of work and um, I think you'd be a good fit, then I'll recommend you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that, you know, everyone is helping each other out there. You know, everyone's friendly. Everyone's talking to one another. It's not, you know, we're not operating in silos. Yeah. We're really very much like, you know, working together because we all want to see each other succeed. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and like building off of that, like I felt the same way yeah. about business school. It's like I come from a social impact background. I was a teacher. I, I studied political science, and I thought business was like a cold, you know, endeavor yeah. where like you know just people are just trying to you know maneuver at each other and profiteer. But like coming to Fuqua 
and seeing all like, my classmates and all the professors like they're, they're well-meaning people who are asking the right questions and they're, they're trying to equip us with the best knowledge and insight so we can go out and do good in the world mm -hmm. and I don't doubt that for a second mm -hmm. and like I, I sit in some of my classes and I'm just like, I'm glad that someone is helping me consider these things mm -hmm. so I can really go out in good faith and be like, you know what, we're doing the right thing, we're trying to. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like a farce. So I, so I really appreciate that. Like, um, I came to business school and saw like a lot of good that can really come about, mm -hmm. like, you know, what happens when you bring people together and you do good business. So like, like I'm really pleased about that. Yeah, yeah. I think, that, yeah, I think people don't think of business and think of, doing good in the world yeah. you know yeah. and so I'm really glad to hear you guys say that that you know you can do yeah, like it, it, it's true. Like, yeah, it's, it, it can really happen, yeah. and, and it makes me really optimistic. And like, I think I did go to business school to play around with this idea that change can happen if you do business better. Mm -hmm. If it's more, yeah. if it's more inclusive, if it's yeah. more, you know, just 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 considering things that you ought to consider or wasn't yeah. previously considered. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like a lot of the people here are forcing me to grapple with that in a very productive way. Mm -hmm. And I'm more comfortable with not having right answers. I'm more comfortable saying, I don't know, help me understand. And people really do help you understand that. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, it's been a pleasure to like really be immersed in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think business is one of the most trusted institutions now, mm -hmm. especially coming out of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. when you think about the different sectors and so, um, I'm really glad that you guys have found that to be the case in terms of you know, how you're how you're able to show up mm -hmm. here and feel supported. Um, so this is an interesting question: How do you navigate promoting Black culture when you are in the minority? And you know, do you have any tips for promoting kind of this notion of diversity, equity, inclusion at the corporate level? So when you think about as a, you're just, you know, as a student, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you might be the only person in the class or one of you. Like, how do you think about representing mm -hmm. both you as an individual, but also you as, you know, your culture yeah. in those and settings? This is something I deal with a lot. Uh, we, we talked about earlier, like, um, in these STEM fields, it's typically not a very predominant black space at all. Right. Um, and so it is typical that sometimes I'm in my class and I might be the only person that looks like me. And um, I come to terms with sometimes that's okay and I shouldn't be afraid of you know being that one person in the room and um, I think what's most important in situations like that is just showing up as myself my most authentic self um, you know um, not being afraid to wear my hair as it is mm -hmm. or come to class in sneakers or you know mm -hmm. or, um, talk with whatever accent I have or um, but I think it's very important you know for people to to be able to see that because um, you like like we talked about a lot about earlier it, you know it sets a precedence for people coming in mm -hmm. um, and it makes it easier for them to follow in line and so I think it's very important yeah, um, yeah I absolutely agree and mm -hmm. I think like I mentioned this earlier I hope it means something that like we did this and mm -hmm. we went and gone MBA and more people can see this is a reality and I, I don't like have any problem going into a place saying like yeah like there are more people like me mm -hmm. That like deserve to be here, mm -hmm. and like, and if that means I like, have to like represent like the, the whole thing, but like it's, it's something where I know we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Like the people in a previous generation did not have an opportunity like this, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that that can happen, and and it can happen repeatedly, even more. And I think um, you know, it, is it a, a burden? I wouldn't say so. I would say it's something where like you go into a place where you're not in the minority. I mean, you're not in the majority, rather. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. let me tell you why you should care about these things. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, you know, one thing I learned about in business school is influence. It's like, the more spaces I'm in, the more I can tell people yeah. about, like, you know, where I come from and the struggles that, that we have, like, problems that could be fixed just by putting your eyeballs on it rather than um, just, um, you know, just pretending like it's not a real thing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I get to communicate that message to people. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a privilege, I would say. Like, and, and I feel like, um, you know, again, like even being uh, the leader of the school, the, the co-president alongside um, my co-president and like both Kendra as well, I hope it means that like, oh, like I can go to a business school, a top tier business school and be in a leadership position and do all the great things and, and like extend a hand backwards so people can come and take in these same, you know, gifts and fruits that I was able to get here. Mm -hmm. And then, so like, I think it's something like I view as a really big privilege. Excellent. Um, for those in the audience who are prospective students, <clears throat> they may be curious about your journey to get here, right? Um, one, 
uh, why did you choose FUQA? And two, um, were there any notions of like imposter syndrome in the process, or were you just like, I got this, and let's <laughs> forge on? Yeah. And so what are your best practices and your hacks for, for getting here, getting into business school? Um, first, first the why Fuqua? Yeah, I think I chose Fuqua um, because everyone I came in contact with was just so authentic. Yeah. Um, every interaction I had, and everybody was like really willing to help. And I thought that that was telling of what the environment was going to be like um, when I got here. Um, yes, I definitely experienced imposter syndrome, um, but I just really had to think about like, look at my, take a look at my resume mm -hmm. and everything like those things speak for themselves and telling myself like, I deserve to be here and like I can get here because I've, I've had a track record of success. And so why wouldn't I be able to be successful here as well and yeah. so just really remembering like what you're capable of yeah was there anything that you did in the application process that you felt really um, was helpful that others in the uh, you know, listening might benefit from um, I think networking again okay. we keep using that word but like reaching out to Fuqua students I knew of um, people that went to Fuqua um, and so I leveraged that, people that graduated from Fuqua at my job, um, just talking to them, talking to them. Also, um, yeah, that's really it, just <laughs> networking, <laughs> networking, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you start, What? how long in advance, how far out in advance did you start that process before you actually applied? I would say it was maybe like, maybe a year okay maybe a year prior that i started having conversations mm -hmm. about it more so with people that i knew okay um and then branching out and just like really talking to people gotcha. after that yeah i can go um so i again being um an undergrad alumni i always knew that you know fuca was um, in my backyard, um, but I, as I was looking at a lot of the different programs and knowing that I wanted to go the executive route, um, I really was drawn to Fuqua because of the uniqueness of the global executive program. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no you know other program that you get to travel to different parts of the world and you are immersed in that culture while also learning about their economy or the way that they you know do business or um, climate change there. Um, and also learning, you know, about how, like, you know, U.S. relations with that country as well, and um, what we can do as the next leaders, you know, um, in our respective fields, right? Mm -hmm. So I was really drawn to that aspect of the, you know, the global piece, the, you know, cultural immersion, um, and I, it was a done deal, really, for me. Um, <laughs> And um, yes, like Kendra, like I experience imposter syndrome every day. Um, even at work, there are some times I'm like, I don't know, like I, do I belong here? I, I, do I feel uh, like this is where I'm supposed to be? But um, having a really strong community is very helpful and just kind of, you know, reminding you that, you know, yes, you are, you are supposed to be here. And like she said, like your resume, your background, like I, you know, have worked so hard to get here, right? Yeah. Um, it speaks, like, my resume and, you know, the things that I've done and, um, you know, where I've gotten it, like, it speaks for itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, also, the admissions process was very, um, you know, unlike other, unlike any other um, process, I had found that the um, admissions, everyone was very helpful. I mean, from day one, um, Kavita was in my inbox and she was just like, hey, <laughs> How are you? How can I help? Um, what can I? Like, what resource can I give you? Who can I put you in contact with? Mm -hmm. um, and then talking to alumni that really just sealed the deal for me, right? Like to be able to get the experience from someone who's done the program, someone who's also done another program, so you can kind of understand like, is this really where I'm supposed to be, right? Um, and someone I also talked to alumni um, that looked like me, you know, that I knew that would really give me the, what we say, the T, right, <laughs> on like what it would actually be like. So I found that that was very important and kind of, you know, really solidified like my decision to, to come here. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, it's a similar story yeah. in terms of like, I want to go somewhere where I can like be myself and like I can like authentically like, you know, just like say what I mean and mean what I say mm -hmm. and have people find it to be valid. and. The entire admissions process, all the people I were connecting with, they found my experience and my background like interesting. Like they, they were like, we need you here. Mm -hmm. And and like 
I want to do pretty big things and I don't have time to, to feel small. Mm -hmm. I felt like this was the only school I would feel like I can do everything I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like I, I didn't want to hide it for the, in, mm -hmm. in these two years. I want to like you know show yeah. what the world I'm made of and show everyone I'm made of what I can do. And uh, you know with the imposter syndrome, I knew that like you know everyone. That's, you know I'll, I'll speak for myself. Like if you have it, I have it. Mm -hmm. And I want to know that like I belong here. Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I belong here. Like I chose this place because it was the best place for me to be all the things I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that so far like. I've done everything I wanted to do, and I still feel like, you know, I only got that insight from everyone who's helping me out through the yeah. entire admissions process. It's like, oh, like, I can just go here and be who I want to be, mm -hmm. and, like, end of discussion. Yeah. Some days will feel a little bit harder. Sometimes you'll have to, you know, fake it a little bit more, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, like, uh, but you'll do it, and you'll do well, and, and I think that, um, you know, like, there's no place I'd rather be than here, like, you know, you know. Well, Stephen, I know you've helped and talked to, to a ton of people. I know they didn't come and talk to me, but like I talked to Stephen. <laughs> so, what do you, what advice do you give folks when you mentor them and coach them around the application process? Yeah, I, I tell them to like look at the values and of the school and see if that really is your operating principle, like, and, and see if you really believe in these things because. I feel like, again, it's a student-led community. We're all, like, you know, putting our best foot forward to make this place run. And if you really feel like, you know, that's not who you are, then, like, it's not. But, like, if you authentically just say, this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is what I want to accomplish, like, mm -hmm. if it's compelling, if it's true, then, like, people will, will take it and accept mm -hmm. that. And, like, you know, like, sometimes, you know, like, what you want or what you think you want doesn't match. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's just, like, the ease of you a with the ease in which you're able to communicate, like mm -hmm. your your beliefs and your principles, if, if it's in alignment, then I think that you know, like mm -hmm. the, the essay and the and the the act of studying for the GMAT, it just happens on its own because mm -hmm. I felt like again, like I felt this was where I could be authentic, and I knew I had to work for it. So like I, I hustled for it, mm -hmm. and because I knew I wanted to be here, and like right. if I didn't want to be here that badly, then I wouldn't actually do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about you, Andy? Okay. Yeah, to the original question, um, I feel very similar to Ozzy. Was, I was looking for a program that was really unique, uh, specifically with like analytics degrees. Um, I feel like industry has just, within the past 10 years, like realized the importance of data mm -hmm. uh, and really like how to like drive progress using data. Mm -hmm. And so programs like MQM are like on the door end. Like I think MQM was only seven years old maybe. Um, and so there aren't many one year programs or even two year programs that focus specifically on that. Um, and so that was already a distinguishing factor that, you know, Fuqua offered that and was one of the first two. Um, but also I think something that stood out amongst like comparable programs is that th that inclusive and team-based culture mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to be like through and through, um, you know, th what the program was. And so I think that is um, why I chose Fuqua. And I mean, of course, I experience imposter syndrome like every single day in my classes. Sometimes I'll write a piece of code and run it and like I have no idea why it worked, <laughs> but it worked and I'm happy, <laughs> you know? And so I think dealing with that, but knowing that like I, I feel like I deserve to be here yeah. and like I'm, yeah, I'm sitting next to people who might have uh, you know, way more experience in like coding or technical things mm -hmm. than I do. Um, but the fact that like we're in the same class right now and like I can have conversations with you about mm -hmm. it and we can work on assignments together and like I understand and I'm able to even help people, mm -hmm. um, it just reinforces that, you know, like I feel like I have a place here. Yeah. And you've had, you have practical experience too, whereas yeah. some of your classmates have never worked, right? Mm -hmm. So That's I think true. you bring that value too. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit to life in Durham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's that like? How, what would you, you know, for folks who've never been to Durham, how would you describe it? What's your favorite part of it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've lived, I've lived in Atlanta and Austin, very large cities, a lot going on, but I'm also from Nassau, Bahamas, so like a very small uh, little island, and mm -hmm. I, I, I liken Durham to Nassau, and in the sense that it's it's very it's quaint, uh, you know. There isn't a lot <laughs> like going on, but there is such a I feel sometimes a strong sense of community, and mm -hmm. once you find that community, it it's fun. Like you know, you can find things to do. There's you know things going on to keep yourself occupied, at least in my experience. And so, um, I think I think Durham is 
a nice city, yeah. <laughs> Going off of that, um, Durham has a very like rich black history, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they also have a very like strong black community, mm -hmm. um, and so you can definitely yeah. find community here outside of Fuqua. Yeah. And like he's saying, there is always something going on. There are mm -hmm. festivals, concerts, um, bars, restaurants. So um, it's not bad. And I also came from living in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, so I do find it to be very quaint and I still like it. Like it's not the hustle and bustle, mm -hmm. but it's a very good place to go to school. You're able to focus, yeah. but you're also still able to have fun when you need to, when mm -hmm. you want to. Okay, good, good. You, yeah. live, you live and work I, here. I am a North Carolina stan. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, look, born and raised in New York, oh okay? Um, and I came here for school and I, you know, I, you know, Duke is very much a bubble, right? In undergrad at least. And then, you know, once you, leave and then you come back I'm sure as a grad student like you know you're able to move around um, yep. but being that I'm you know in a, in a unique position as a Gimba so we're traveling we don't you know we have a few residencies here um, but I, I live in Cary and I've lived in Durham I've lived in Raleigh mm -hmm. um, I agree with everything you guys have said I also think Durham's proximity is very important you know you have your Raleigh you have your Charlotte you can be in DC in a few mm -hmm. hours you can be in Atlanta in a few hours right Driving, um, driving, 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 driving is less than an hour. <laughs> very true, very true. I mean, even when I, I go visit my parents and in an hour I am home, right? Yeah. So I really appreciate that proximity um, just to be able to, you know, hop over to another town and experience something different. Um, you have the beach and the mountains, you know, like maybe two hours, two to three hours you're there, right? Um, and then, again, like Durham itself, I mean, you have a great food culture, a great community culture. Um, there's just so much going on, and if you, like, if you want to look for it, like, you'll find it. Um, so I really appreciate what Durham is, I mean, it's growing, and in the next five years, it's going to be something completely, you know, different. So. Um, I highly recommend tapping into it now because you may not recognize it and you might be lost in trying to find your way, but um, North Carolina stand here. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say plus one all of that and like explore Durham with your friends. Yeah, and, like, yeah, and, like, for sure. You get to like have this like really tight community at school mm -hmm. and then when you like find that community, like you get to like have the world as your oyster. And I think like if you explore Durham earnestly, like it's gonna surprise you every day. Mm -hmm. So many things to do, so many things to see, so many hikes, to, um, trails to hike mm -hmm. rather. Like it's just a, it's a cool place to really explore with yeah. friends. Mm -hmm. I like it, I like it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I have a couple questions just, you know, for specific folks. Um, Kendra, you completed a summer internship at Procter & Gamble. I did. Right? And it sounds like it's went well because yes. you'll be gone and congratulations there. yeah Thank absolutely you. um did you rely on any skills uh, when you did your internship that you got from your first year and you know how did you incorporate those yes yeah, so um all of my marketing classes mm -hmm. um market research strategic strategic brand management um all of those skills really came into play more so than i thought they would um, during my internship, like I was actually like looking at class notes yeah. <laughs> while I was um, at my internship. So definitely pulled skills from my specific marketing classes mm -hmm. uh, for that. Mm -hmm. And then you also participated, maybe you could share a little bit about the experiential programs at, at Fuqua. You participated in GATE? Did you yes, yes. So I did GATE, which is the Global That's Academic right. Travel Experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and we went to South Africa, we went to both Cape Town and Johannesburg. Um, it's a two week mm -hmm. program. Um, you take a class during the term and um, the class accumulates with the um, trip to South Africa mm -hmm. where you actually get to be um, immersed in the culture. Um, and we also got to visit like local companies and company owners, um, which was one of my favorite parts of the trip. We actually got to um, hear and meet with um, two women who were owners of like one of the biggest hair care oh, lines yeah. in South Africa and just talking about their um, entrepreneurial journey um, and things like that. We got to visit Nando's, which I don't know if y'all oh, yeah. yeah. chicken yeah. place. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's talk with the owner. That was my first time having Nando's. It's oh, amazing. Wow. <laughs> um, so it's a really awesome um, experience. We got to visit a school um, and spend a day just talking to the kids in South Africa, mentoring them. So uh, it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Did you exchange 
I also did exchange. I just got back from exchange a couple weeks ago. Um, so I went to Paris, where really the school is in Sergi, which is a city outside of Paris. Um, but I went to Essex Business School, and I did the uh, one-week intensive course in digital marketing, um, which was also pretty cool just to see you know, how other countries teach, especially teach marketing, um, and interact with the other international students there. So um, I was in class with um, people that were from Paris, but a lot of the other students were from abroad, from a plethora of different countries. So um, it was amazing to just be in that class, and it was just like a melting pot. Um, so that was an awesome experience as excellent, well. Excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, what about you, Enrique? Can you talk to them, you know, for those who, who don't, are familiar, are familiar with the um, MQM program, first of all, what track are you in? A strategy track. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And kind of share a typical day. What's a typical day like for you as a student? Yeah, so um, classes is normal, um, typically <laughs> two or three a day, and those are really a lot of times discussion-based, and mm -hmm. we run through like uh, snippets of code or like some practical assignment, and. Um, then typically after that, I'll have like meetings. Like I mentioned, I'm on the MQM Association, so uh, those meetings just consist of like putting on programming events for the entire MQM class, sort of like the MBA Association, and uh, that's always very fulfilling as well. Um, also, there might be like an admissions meeting. So right now, uh, we're in the like round two heat of like applications, and so I'm like conducting interviews for like students um, who are like looking to get admitted, and so that keeps me busy. Uh, and then it might work on like some team assignments. Like like I mentioned, a lot of uh, the assignments are team based, and so I'll meet with my team, um, go over stuff, and then I will end the day, um, you know, job search, recruiting, <laughs> doing some homework as well. And so, yeah, pretty pretty typical day in the program. Okay. Yeah. And when you think about the learning environment between here and uh, your experience at Morehouse, how, how is it different mm -hmm. in terms of how you, hmm. that learning environment? I think about this question a lot. Um, <laughs> and so, I don't know, I think, hmm, we talked about like black excellence a lot mm -hmm. throughout this. And so I would say at Morehouse, um, I'm not gonna say that there is not like collaboration, but there is still this kind of like self-interest to succeed and so mm -hmm. it feels like a very uh, competitive environment sometimes like mm -hmm. you always want to be on top of your game mm -hmm. um, and that's not saying that you're not helping people come with you but mm -hmm. it's you know that 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 push is always going I would say here while everyone is also still trying to succeed and achieve whatever goals it feels a little more collaborative mm -hmm. at least in my experience um, mm -hmm. especially with like the team-based learning and um, so I, I think that's one thing I noticed. Okay, okay. great. Okay, good. So interesting. Um, and your your plans for after graduation? What are you interested in doing? Yeah, so I'm looking to return back into the technology industry, uh, mm -hmm. specifically in product management. And so I'm actually in the middle of recruiting right now. Mm -hmm. So wish me luck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, really excited. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then uh, let's go to you, Stephen. Okay. I'm going to ask you. Can you share? Um, a little bit about your role as co-president and some of the initiatives that you've been able to um, you know, put forward um, for your classmates. Absolutely. So um, the MBA is essentially the student government body for the MBA, um, the daytime program. Mm -hmm. And like we pretty much help the school you know, conduct its business, mm -hmm. you know, uh, student organizations, you know, scheduling conflicts, you know, budget allocation, you know, like a lot of students have ideas and want to create stuff and we have to evaluate their plans and we have to like, you know, just pretty much do the basic functionings of our student body, mm -hmm. like being a student-led community. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of initiative, I'll point out one initiative that I'm, I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. It's like a, we wanted to build a, a platform of inclusion, uh, in, it's called a collaborative, uh, inclusive collaboration rather. So we put forth it, uh, kind of like a proposal that clubs who are planning more, um, you know, events or you know, get-togethers that build bridges across lines of difference that um, that we will fund it and we will um, you know kind of mm -hmm. champion that. And this year, so many more clubs were able to again like this meet us where we kind of left that marker and do so many cool collaborative events. Like uh, Asian Business Club did an event with um, the Latinx uh, Management Association. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know of the DAFA, which is our Armed Forces Association for our veterans, did an event with Fuqua Fit, which is a, a club that you know historically never collaborated in such a way. Mm -hmm. And I feel like 
what we were trying to do was build more of a culture where like we see each other and we understand each other and we respect each other and like we can take a lot of the, the wisdom that you gain from working with someone who you're not usually working with, mm -hmm. bring it back and bring that same, you know, that, that kind of like understanding and care mm -hmm. towards the things that you do in your club on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I was just really proud about that. Yeah, I love that because it also helps to introduce people who may not be familiar, mm -hmm. you know, people who are very familiar with their own club but might not be familiar with what's happening in other clubs Absolutely. or the people in those clubs, right? Yeah. It creates that and opportunity. And you meet connection. so many more people. Yeah. You meet all these people that you would not ordinarily run mm -hmm. into. And I do think that's where, like, uh, you know, a lot of new ideas come about when you're just like having a conversation with someone you're usually not having a conversation mm -hmm. with, yeah. especially if you're working towards something. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. Um, can you describe a typical day as a second year MBA student? What's your day like? So uh, I think the, the typical life of an MBA student in the second year is like a little bit different from. Uh, well, what's, what? your <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what's your yeah, day? Yeah. Like? Yeah. So like, like being an, in the MBA and being the co-president, like uh, me and my co-president Aria, like we're, we're constantly. You know, either meeting or getting together or solving problems or you know, emergency Zoom calls. So, like, you always have to have a level of uh, mm -hmm. flexibility on the schedule for that. But also, you get to do a lot of really cool things. Like, this term, I'm taking uh, three really cool classes okay. uh, corporate finance with John Graham, who I, I think is just like probably the best professor I've, uh, I know of. I'm taking, I'm um, doing a mentor study with the Kirby Prize where we're helping to um, select uh, a grant recipient for uh, scaling a social venture. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking also social entrepreneurship with Kathy Clark, who is uh, just, you know, phenomenal. She's in the, the forefront of, of her uh, industry. So classes and all of the work that comes with classes. But then there's also really cool stuff. Like, you know, you get to like, you know, meet with the deans every now and then. You get to like meet with like people who want to meet with you because you're the, the, the co-president. Like I had a really cool meeting with um, an executive at, um, at a, CBS Icon, or Paramount rather, and like it, it's these things just pop up, and and you get to just like take it in, and you get to like really, um, you know, use that as a as a working point to like figure out what to do next. It's like all right, I had this meeting, so I got to do this now, so I have to carve out a block for that. You know, I have these uh, group assignments, so I have to like meet them, but also I have to figure out what I'm gonna like get back to these people about these mm -hmm. things. So like. It, the, every day is not the same, but like it's not the typical day for yeah. uh, a secondary MBA. Like it, it's usually more like relaxed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to accomplish before you graduate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, again, like I, I, I really hope that um, more candidates of color can, can come through our school and find a, a home here, and and I, I want to play a, a very big role in making that happen. And so, like you know, like interview prepping. You know, just like helping people talk through, like you know, their why, and you know, all these things. I want to make sure that you know, more students can find a home here and find the opportunities that I could have never imagined. And I, I hope I can play a role in that. Great. And then Ozzy, what about you as a working professional? Can you talk a little bit for those who may not understand, like what your day is like? How do you balance between working full time and going to school full time? What is that? What does your day look like? Yeah. Um, I am very, I have a routine down, you know, I very much stick to my nine to five during the day, um, you know, with lunch and, you know, different things like the gym, you know, throughout that just to kind of, you know, keep my head, keep myself sane. Um, and then after that, it, it really talk about like shutting your work laptop and then opening up your, your school laptop or iPad. Um, and that's how it works for me, especially, um, after residency, right? So during residency, um, it's a little different when you're traveling. Some folks will take PTO, um, or some folks have to, you know, they're working and also in school as well, so they're working around the clock. You know, they might have to step out for a call um, during lunch or something, or, you know, during uh, class to deal with a work um, mm -hmm. issue and then come back. Um, but when I'm back for the distance portion, it's very much, you know, work, and then after that, um, you know, I will get on a call with my team, um, you know, like Enrique said, like it's very much team-based learning, so we have to talk about a project or something um, in a case that's due, um, like, you know, a few days later. Um, and then you have to prep for classes. Um, our classes are like Saturday mornings, so you have to prep for class throughout that week. So it's like my, after my nine to five, my, you know, my five to nine starts, right? Um, so really just trying to, you know, I'd have a routine where I balance, like, you know, work during the day and then schoolwork mm -hmm. um, in the evening. Mm -hmm. yeah. And can you talk a little bit about your residencies, how often we're yeah. Go so that for people who don't know. Sure. Mm -hmm. So residency, ha they happen about um, every three months. So maybe maybe every four months, once a quarter. Um, there are about uh, there are seven of them, but f five, 
four or five um, are lo all over the world, and um, the program does a really good job of trying to have a residency um, in every part of the world. So we do um, Southeast Asia, um, you know, Latin America, um, uh, Europe, and then I'm forgetting an, a few other places, but um, it just came back from Chile, so that was our Latin America residency. Um, we're there for about somewhere between 10 to 12 days, <coughs> um, and you can travel before, you can travel after, which is a really cool, um, neat aspect of it. And um, for those 10 days, you were immersed in you know, the culture there, but also you were in class, um, as well as you know, doing different like, cultural tours, um, corporate visits, so you really get a mix of you know, your in-class learning and then your, your learning gotcha. outside of the class, so it's really and cool. Is there any, or can you just point to one thing that you've learned in, in your curriculum? Any, any of your classes yeah. that you've been able to immediately, it's been really beneficial. Mm, helpful, in, yeah. In work. Um, I think, I mean, it's funny, one of the our classes that we took our um, first term was managerial effectiveness, and okay. it was with our um, our professor, Noah Eisencraft, who was a really great professor, and he just talked about, um, you know, how sometimes it, you know, to make change, it, it you have to start with relationship building, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't just, you know, say like, well, I want to do this and then try and start implementing it right away, right? You, depending on where, whether you're, you know, at the top or you're in the middle at the bottom or wherever you are in the hierarchy of your organization, it really is all about, you know, building those relationships um, and then, you know, bringing people together in order to, you know, make that change happen. So that, that was something that I really, you know, took, took in mind as we were doing some of our um, final projects and just thinking about some of the things I wanted to change in my current career place of work. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you guys, it's been a pleasure and a joy, and this time has gone by really, really quickly, but we're like right <laughs> on time, <laughs> out of time. Um, I just want to thank you so much for being so open and honest and, you know, you know, giving of yourself and your insights have been really wonderful to hear. I hope, hopefully all of you out there has, have enjoyed it just as much as I have. I want to thank our panelists and our guests. I want to thank each of you out there for taking the time and uh, hopefully you will join us for our next session on Wednesday, March 27th. It's called Fierce Females at Fuqua, mm -hmm. uh, Voices of Strength and Success. And so, I mean, here's to, here's to black excellence, yes, right? Here's to black excellence. Cheers. Yes. Right. Thanks, everybody. Be good. Good luck. Um,